Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. As we resume our study on online hate, we have a couple of procedural things to start with. Uh, Mr. Garrison? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, not being the permanent uh, representative on this committee, I received a very low, late notice that this session was to be televised. And I guess uh, my question is that none of the previous uh, testimony by witnesses has been televised. And so uh, it seems peculiar to me that only the last uh, segment of this would actually be televised by the committee. So um, I, I guess I want to ask the chair um, why, why, that takes, why that's taking place, but, but perhaps short circuit that by sim simply saying that I'll move at this time that this meeting not be televised any further. I'm going to not be televised. Still, yeah. I don't think it would be debatable, I mean. Oh. Okay, so, so it is a receivable motion which is non-debatable and non-amendable according to the clerk. Uh, we will not televise this, uh, the rest of this meeting, and I will suspend for one minute, and we will move to an audio recording, and then we will hopefully start with the witnesses. Today, um, as individuals, we have Ms. Lindsay Shepard. Welcome. Mr. John Robson, welcome. And Mr. Mark Stein, welcome. Uh, thank you very uh, much, uh, Monsieur le Président, and also to the uh, honourable members of the committee. I am uh, honoured uh, to be here. Um, I, would, I would just like to say a quick word on the, uh, as much as I always enjoy seeing Miss Raitt, uh, about the defenestration of Mr. Cooper from this committee, which I understand is the business of the members of the committee. Uh, but I, I am concerned, I was driving into Ottawa listening to my old friend Evan Solomon on the radio who was arguing that in fact uh, it was perhaps time for Mr. Cooper to be booted from caucus. Uh, that is actually the age we live in, where people can have one uh, infraction and their life implodes, their career implodes, they're vaporized for it. Uh, and that is actually one of the most disturbing trends on the free speech issue. The surviving vice chair of this committee uh, said uh, recently that Jordan Peterson should not be permitted to testify to this committee. Bernie Farber, uh, just I believe just last night, said Lindsay Shepard should be booted from appearing before this committee. Uh, Ms. Shepard and uh, Mr. Peterson are law-abiding Canadian citizens, and this practice of labelling people uh, and demanding that they be uh, instantly deplatformed, booted from uh, polite society is in fact more serious uh, than some of the other matters before this committee. I was here last time round, 10 years ago, when we got rid of Section 13, because it was corrupt uh, in absolutely every aspect of its operation, uh, from minor bureaucrats uh, indulging strange James Bond fantasies and playing undercover dress-up Nazis on the internet, to pathetic rubber-stamp jurists who gave Section 13 a 100% conviction rate uh, that uh, even respectable chaps like Kim Jong-un and Saddam Hussein would have thought was perfectly ridiculous. The worst aspect of it was secret trials. Secret trials in Ottawa. Not in Tehran or Pyongyang, but in Ottawa. I discovered it one evening before dinner, and I emailed my friends at McLean's and um, the eminent barrister Julian Porter, whom I see uh, the Prime Minister recently retained as his QC. That's how respectable he is. And Julian, in a couple of hours, wrote a motion uh, referencing uh, Viscount Haldane and Ambard versus Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, real law, not the pseudo law of Section 13, and did what John did. He, uh, Julian's motion, opened up that dank, uh, fetid dungeon of pseudo justice to the public, to the people of Canada. And after 20 minutes in the cleansing sunlight that John talked about, uh, the unimpressive jurist in that case, Athan Athanios Hadjis, uh, decided that Section 13 was unconstitutional and he wasn't going to have anything more to do with it. Sunshine works. 
The most important aspect, while we're quoting judges, uh, John Moulton uh, 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 wrote a famous essay a century ago on uh, the realm of manners. And he said the measure of, of a society is not what one is forbidden to do, which is to murder and steal and rape, and not what one is compelled to do, such as pay the taxes or join the army or whatever, but you measure a society by the space in between, the realm of manners, where free people regulate themselves. Canadians do not bash gays uh, or lynch minorities because they are enjoined by the state not to do so. They do so because they are operating in Lord Moulton's realm of manners uh, where free people, civilized people, regulate themselves. And that is where the internal contradictions of a fractious, multicultural society uh, should be uh, played out. The idea of bureaucrats once again getting into this business uh, is, is deeply disturbing. They didn't have enough work last time. They had to actually, uh, shortly before the McLean's case, which was the one I was involved in, uh, the senior counsel of the Canadian Human Rights Commission actually went to Toronto to speak to various groups to say they weren't getting enough cases and that's why uh, people should file more complaints. Ultimately, free speech is hate speech and hate speech is free speech. It's for the speech you hate, the speech you revile. The alternative to free speech is approved speech and that necessarily means approved by whom? Well, approved uh, by yourself as a citizen, if you don't want to have Lindsay Shepherd over to dinner, as Bernie Farber doesn't, that's fair enough. But once it becomes speech approved by the state and speech uh, approved by formal bodies, it effectively means the speech approved by the powerful. The biggest threat to free speech at the moment is a malign alliance between governments and big tech doing the kind of things Lindsay spoke of. The photograph that sums it up is the one of Mr. Trudeau with uh, Mrs. May and Miss Ardern and uh, President Macron in Paris the other day, sitting opposite across the table from the heads of Facebook, Twitter, Google uh, and uh, Apple. Uh, six woke billionaires who presume to uh, regulate the opinions of all seven billion people on this planet. That is far more of a threat than some pimply 17-year-old neo-Nazi tweeting in his mother's basement somewhere out on the prairies. And that issue, that is the real threat to genuine liberty uh, in our society. I cannot believe that a mere 10 years on we are talking about restoring this law. It was appalling and unfortunately this committee and the House never actually confronted it in reality. But I will finally, I will finally say this on a personal note. I was born in Canada. I love Canada. I would die for Canada. I am old-fashioned enough to take the allegiance of citizenship seriously. But no monarch, no parliament, no government, and certainly no bureaucratic agency operating the pseudo-law of Section 13 can claim jurisdiction over my right to think freely, uh, to read freely, to speak freely, and to argue freely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much to all the witnesses. We're now going to go to questions. We're going to start with Mr. Barrett. Uh, Mr. Stein, one of uh, the ideas that's been raised by the committee and uh, by the Prime Minister is, uh, as you mentioned, the reinstatement of Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. So you had, um, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, involvement in litigating this section um, and its subsequent repeal. Could you expand on your experience in that regard to Section 13 and um, the utility of legislation like that? Well, as I said, the problem with Section 13 is that Canadians aren't very hateful people, so there was a lack of real serious complaint. Uh, 
one man had his name on every uh, complaint since 2002. A man called uh, Richard Warman was the plaintiff on every Section 13 complaint since 2002. Uh, as a, it's a bit like Groundhog Day for me, uh, this, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll proceed anyway. Uh, as, as I mentioned last time round, uh, some of you may know that uh, there was a self-appointed witch finder general in England some centuries back, and uh, for whatever it was, uh, two pounds, uh, he'd go out and find witches. Richard Warman was the hate finder general of Canada from 2002. One plaintiff on every single complaint. Uh, these, these, the, the offending material was seen by nobody. Um, one, uh, one post that the Canadian Human Rights Commission spent years investigating under Section 13 had been viewed by 0.8 of a Canadian, or if you include uh, territories, uh, 0.6713 of a Canadian, something like that. Uh, and most of those 0.6713s of a Canadian were undercover agents of the, uh, of the Human Rights Commission whiling away their time at taxpayer expense uh, on, uh, on, on uh, groups like Stormfront. In other words, Dean Stesey and Richard Warman of the Canadian Human Rights Commission joined neo-Nazi groups. There weren't enough neo-Nazis in Canada. So we had servants of the crown pretending to be neo-Nazis, which is preposterous. They were aided by Sergeant Camp, uh, for example, of the Edmonton Police, who was also a member of Stormfront. So if you are one of the three neo-Nazis in Canada, and you go online of an afternoon thinking you'll meet like-minded neo-Nazis, you'll find that the only people on Stormfront are Dean Stesey of the CHRC uh, trying to entrap Richard Warman of the CHRC, trying to uh, entrap Sergeant Camp of the Edmonton Police. It was a corrupt and indefensible racket, and I have heard nothing from the witnesses before this committee uh, that would suggest we are any more capable today of preventing those abuses. Thank you very much. Mr. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be uh, sharing my time with Mr. Erskine-Smith. Okay, I'll give my time to Mr. Erskine-Smith. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Eid Mubarak, everyone. There are thousands of uh, peaceful, uh, loving, and welcoming Muslims in my riding right now. Uh, I'm normally in Dentonia Park with them. Um, I'm here with you instead. And so, Mr. Stein, uh, in, in light of Mr. Robson's comments about sunlight and having a more civil back and forth about uh, comments rather than uh, ensuring uh, the, the stiff penalty of the criminal law, you've previously said about moderate Muslims. Uh, that they uh, want stoning for adultery to be introduced in Liverpool, but they're moderates because they can't be bothered flying a plane into a skyscraper to get it. Um, do you regret anything that you've said about Muslims? Well, I'm a great believer in, in first principles, sir. Um, and the, que the question is, clearly thing, things that are said uh, uh, in the course of public discourse are offensive, uh, obnoxious, are hurtful. The question before this panel is, should they be criminalized? No, no, but my question to you is, do you regret anything you've said about Muslims? I regret many things I've said on many subjects Fair, uh, that's, 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 that's uh, over the years. I will say, here, here's, but here's the difference. Nassim Mithuwani, who I like a lot, I've, I've run into Nassim every couple of years, and I like her enormously. I like Muniz, I quite like Kurama Wan, who was the third of those Muslims who uh, uh, attempted to criminalize my writing. But I think there is a difference in this. I'm willing to debate you. I'm willing to debate Nassim. Uh, I'm not willing to go along with the big shutter. 